I'd like to welcome the next panel that we have here and introduce them briefly. But we've got uh, Professor John Noggle from uh, our own Army War College from the School of Strategic Leadership. He's a similar panel that did an integrated research project similar to what we did with an integrated research project, but this is another effort. And they were specifically looking at some of the lessons learned from Ukraine and some of the activities out there and trying to integrate some of that to try to project towards the future. He's assembled an all-star cast of students that volunteered for this extra effort, plus faculty members that are joining him here on the panel. And I'm going to turn it over to him, but um, I hope you have some pointed and difficult questions for him because he is um, looking forward to an intellectual challenge. John, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Craig. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here. Um, uh, super proud of this team, uh, only a few of whom are here. I've got a bunch of my other team members uh, sitting here in the audience. Others are other places. Uh, but um, just about a year ago, uh, our friend Ian Sullivan, from whom you just heard absolutely terrific China presentation, uh, at, was uh, um, talking with General Funk, then the uh, commander of the Training and Doctrine Command, and General Funk said one of the things that he was interested in was casualty rates among senior officers on the Russian side <coughs> in the Russo-Ukrainian War. Ian reached out to the U.S. Army War College and asked if someone here at the War College would be interested in taking a look at that particular problem. Uh, that question came initially to me and to Al Lord of the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations here at the School of Strategic Land Power. Uh, and we assembled a team of faculty across a number of departments. Uh, and then uh, what ended up being a team of 15 students who looked not just at that particular questions, but tried to do an integrated lessons learned study of the first year of the Russo-Ukrainian War. And you can see the names of some of the faculty members up there. Uh, we'll we'll uh, pull up uh, the full list of, of names of all of the students who participated at the very end. Slide, please. Uh, and, and so TRADOC asked us to take a look at that question. Uh, and, and, and we believe that uh, the, the opportunity to examine a large-scale combat operation <laughs> between a great power a uh, declining former superpower and a middle power is a very rare opportunity in, in, in the study of warfare. This is the biggest war in Europe uh, since World War II, uh, and, and you don't see this kind of thing very often. And so I was very, very pleased to be asked and tasked to assemble a team of, of really honestly crack officers, as I look at, at some of them here, including uh, our Ukrainian international fellow, the only officer that Ukraine sent out of country, uh, this year, and I'd ask you to join me in, in um, uh, thanking Vladimir for his service here and, and his country, for his country. And, and Vladimir has been uh, an inspiration to our group as we have lurked, worked to capture studies, ca uh, capture lessons from this, uh, from this war. We've got uh, four of our students um, uh, uh, who are going to present some of those lessons learned. Uh, my uh, West Point classmate uh, from the famed West Point class of 1988, Bob Hamilton, who is leading 88, a- 88. 88, sorry, what did I say? I, it sounded to me like you said 80. We're not that old. We're working on it, brother. <laughs> We're working on it. But, but, but Bob, I mean, colonels are getting younger every yeah, year, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah crazy. Uh, uh, Bob is going to uh, provide some comments and some reactions uh, to the study, and then is going to talk, I think, a little bit about a not dissimilar study that the uh, uh, Strategic Studies Institute here is doing uh, on, on uh, the war as well. Uh, we're going to start off with our Chief of Staff, Lieutenant Colonel Katie Crome, who has done just terrific work herding this, uh, this group of cats. Lieutenant Colonel Crome. Thanks, Dr. Noggle. And just want to extend my great thanks to all the students that Dr. Noggle referenced. We are going to keep all of our questions to the end, and then when you ask us one that's too hard up for the panel, we're going to direct it to our friends back there who are the experts in each of the war fighting functions. Next slide, please. Maybe. <laughs> okay, good morning. So we're going to start today by talking about something 50 years ago. Um, in 1988, not 50 years ago, but the first point, in 1988, Dr. Andy Grove, who is the president of CEO of the Intel Corporation at the time, coined the phrase strategic inflection point to describe a fundamental change in the well-being of an organization. 
He visually depicted that point that you can see on the top of the slide as the exact point in time where the nature of an organization changes in a subtle but profound and lasting fashion, leading to a path of rapid growth or decline, but never status quo. At this juncture, adept and creative leaders and organizations recognize and accept this choice, advancing their organizations to meet the moment. Conversely, rigid, hesitant, or risk-averse leaders and organizations fail to accept this departure in time, leading to a path of irrelevance and potential failure. 50 years ago, in 1973, the US Army faced a strategic inflection point. The US intervention in Vietnam left the Army demoralized, and American leadership watched on as the Soviet-equipped Egyptian armed forces nearly defeated the US-equipped Israeli defense forces in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. In response, the chief of staff of the Army at the time, Creighton Abrams, established the US Training and Doctrine Command that we know as TRADOC today to reorient thinking and doctrine around the conventional Soviet threat. Chief of Staff of the Army, Creighton Abrams, selected his good friend, General William DePew, to lead this new organization, looking at studying the Yom Kippur War to develop new concepts, drive procurement and material changes, and prepare the Army to fight a modern war. The Secretary of Defense Schlesinger, Chief Abrams, and General DePue recognized that the Army faced a strategic inflection point, and only a monumental shift in the way we thought and the way we fought could prepare us for the changing character of war. The resultant lessons learned in the associated reports, all widespread and unclassified, led to the development of air land battle and active defense, and set us up for great success in joint warfare later in the Gulf War in the 1990s. 50 years later, the US Army faces a new strategic inflection point, a choice to fundamentally alter the way the US Army prepares for the next fight. Next slide, please. So why are we talking about this now? We know that we're not alone in studying this conflict, but we do come up about it from a different angle. Uh, we're usually practitioners, but we're on a little year sabbatical to think about this deeply. And so we have some lessons learned from 15 students that we're going to, to talk about today. I'm going to highlight kind of five of the overarching lessons and then turn it over to my friends to talk in depth about the rest. So first, although we talk and teach mission command, we have not truly embraced the culture required to execute mission command. Our command decision structures remain largely hierarchical in both garrison and wartime. Our culture does not incentivize risk taking, making delegation of responsibilities a rare occurrence in both peace and wartime. Second, in line with our thinking about mission command, we have, not, uh, we have not created the C2 nodes that we need for the future. Right now in the Ukraine, they have seven man or woman nodes that are jumping twice a day. We're used to rooms like this, stadium-sized jocks, conference rooms, perfect communication. We are not prepared for the C2 of the future. Third, the massive scale and scope of the Russo-Ukrainian war has exposed significant shortfalls in both munitions and personnel. This is much broader than a recruiting problem. That's really a one-year problem. This is an eight-year problem rooted around the individual ready reserve. And we have a team member, Stephen Tronosky, that can talk later about the valley of death, he calls it, in preparing for personnel replacement in the future. The bottom line, we have nowhere near enough people to fight a large-scale combat operation. Fourth, the casualty projection is vast in the American public. The Joint Force and the Army is not ready for it. The projections now could see the amount of casual, casualties that we saw in the last two decades of war in only two weeks. And finally, there are fundamental changes to the character of war that are happening rapidly and every day. Artificial intelligence and machine learning has changed the way that we fight. It's changed the way that we're thinking. And right now, we don't own the timeline for how quickly this will change. And we certainly don't own the risk, or we will certainly own the risk. Next slide, please. So we're gonna spend about the next 30 minutes going through each of our lessons rooted around the war fighting functions. As we talked about before, these team members are representing a larger team, so if you guys can hold the questions to the end, that would be fabulous. Jay. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, I'll share some insights derived by this chapter's author, Lieutenant Colonel Jay Tunis. Going forward, next slide, please. Jay examined Ukraine's command and control, mission command, senior leader resilience, and replacement operations. The initial lessons learned highlighted a well-designed and executed professional, professional military education and training system for command and control is important to facilitate successful operations. 
especially when executed in combat across a contested, <coughs> distributed, and denied environment. The U.S. should per the U.S. should review PME programs to assess whether the Mission Command is being well trained at this point. The increasingly complex character of war with technologically advanced domains and data-driven decisions made in near real time may become increasingly counterproductive to exercising Mission Command and may outpace the human cognitive ability. Over-reliance on systems and data to exercise command and control may impact speed and the latitude to exercise discipline initiative and impede decisions made by subordinate leaders. The U.S. Army must examine its resilience on C-2 systems and its effects on decision-making and mission command. C-2 must attain a balance of understanding and informing the complexity of synchronizing operations. On this slide, under its first key point, it's vital, to conduct, uh, it's vital we conduct further research to understand what large-scale combat operations at the division and above level is and what large-scale combat operations at the BCT level and below is. Command and control of large-scale combat operations at the division and above levels appears to require orchestrating the convergence of technology and data across all domains to create windows of opportunity for commanders. At the BCT and below level, command and control through combined arms and a tactical type will be anchored to the mastery of tactics and brilliance in the basics. Leaders must prepare <coughs> for decentralized operations in a communication and denied environment across a non-contiguous operational space. Envision a brigade fight, brigade on brigade, with a map, compass only, and understanding commander's intent and guidance to operate it while fighting to achieve that end state. Under point two, discipline obedience or discipline initiative, they may be one and the same. Leaders must understand the intent and effects required. When required, pr quickly read situations, adapt, and adjust to actions to achieve the intent and end state. Three. Rehearsals will always prove invaluable through professional military education and training. That's at home station and home station collective and at the training centers. We must cultivate mission command and the aspect of disciplined disobedience or disciplined initiative at all levels of leadership. Deliberate and thorough training in basic soldiering skills, leadership development, and collective training on our mission essential task will ensure, will ensure when dispersed and disconnected leaders direct units to achieve effects based on the commander's intent. The last point on this slide regarding reconstitution and resilience is something that Steve, uh, my partner on the left, and Steve Chernosky will hit on later on in this brief. Next slide, please. For fires. I examined fires uh, for Ukraine across open source material, and what I found was there was limited modernization of Ukrainian artillery after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Like our military, Ukraine confronted strategic choices. With limited modernization of fires, Ukraine found opportunity when they adopted a, a open source uh, developed application that executed converging fires, intelligence, common operating picture, and command and control. That turned their legacy Soviet doctor, doctrine and systems into highly effective, responsive, and accurate <coughs> fires. As the war progressed, Ukraine quickly adapted and integrated Western-provided capabilities, further increasing the success in delivering fires. The key lessons that I derived from my study were that the U.S. must prepare for LESCO to be a war of attrition. Fires requires both precision and massing. The volume of munitions being fired is staggering and highlights the questions regarding our own magazine depth and the ability of our defense industry base to meet this demand. These are critical follow-on areas that we must examine with urgency. Responsiveness in, in identifying and delivering fires must be improved. We must modernize support relationships of artillery to enhance our responsiveness and increase the interconnectedness attaining our own Uber for artillery. This will further the any sensor best shooter concept already underway. Third point is that our U.S. Army must modernize our legacy targeting and airspace management process. The key question is how do our allies and partners fit into our future fight given the partner environment and the interoperability of our current systems? With the allies, with allies and partners, the complexity of airspace management increases. We must develop the capacity to integrate artificial intelligence now with our partners and determine where we must retain humans in the loop, but identify areas where we integrate AI to influence responsiveness, improve targeting, and safeguard both blue and green air. Four, 
Targeting has a half-life, and intelligence accuracy decays with time, but we can't play shiny object or whack-a-mole. We must maintain a balance of deliberate and dynamic targeting to ensure we maintain the capacity to deliberately create windows of opportunity. The air tasking order process must be scrutinized to determine if its responsiveness, given the anticipated West Go tempo, meets our demand. And lastly, under fires, expertise takes time to develop. We must become next gunner capable. The levels must be developed early in the professional timeline. Strategic fires and joint targeting typically have been fields for seasoned or more senior leader expertise. We must develop our targeting experts earlier in their fires targeting career. Additionally on this slide, I'll do my best to convey uh, the material that Jason, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Loicki uh, examined in his uh, chapter on maneuver for our team. A lot has been written on and continues to be written on the maneuver lessons learned from the war in Ukraine. The good news is that our findings reinforce the Army's current LESCO training and doctrine path. A couple of key findings. What we have seen and continue to see is the application of the basic principles of maneuver warfare and the application of combined arms is decisive. Specifically, Russia's inability to integrate armor and infantry with artillery has proven decisive in creating opportunity for Ukrainian success. With that being said, the Army needs to continue to train and master true combined arms. At the strategic and operational level, this includes multi-domain operations, but at the tactical level, this is mastering the basics, the blocking and tackling, armor, infantry, and fires combined to enable successful maneuvers. Each complement each other without the ability to achieve combined arms will likely lead to failure of the other. We do this through tough and realistic training, reps and sets at home station and at our combat training center. We must maintain proficiency in our urban and real, rural operational areas, not just the infantry, light mechanized or striker, but the armor formations as well. Not forgetting the lessons learned from the past two decades, we must capture and apply these lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan that will most certainly influence our success in large-scale combat operations. Next, we must continue to development, continue the development and training of critical weapon systems, specifically anti-armor capabilities, our javelins, our toes, of course, our, our Carl Gustavs. The brigade combat team will remain pivotal in large-scale combat, combat operations, but must be resourced to con conduct decentralized operations while applying a command structure that allows subordinates freedom to exercise discipline and initiative within the overall operational strategy. Lastly, as seen in Ukraine, there's nowhere to hide on the battlefield. Maneuver elements need to be able to operate in an austere and degraded environment in small units with decentralized C2, which requires clear commander's guidance and intent, allowing for subordinates the ability to execute discipline <coughs> initiative. Continuous mobility and moving will be critical. But as seen in Ukraine, stagnant lines can quickly emerge due to conditions such as weather, terrain, and culmination. Thanks, Jay. Steve? All right. Uh, continue some of the great points. Uh, made by Jay, you know, I had the opportunity to study uh, multi-domain operations the, and how the war in Ukraine provides a unique opportunity to analyze our new doctrine on FM-303 multi-domain operations, much like Katie referenced earlier, uh, how we learned from the 1973 Yom Kippur War, and then how this might inform training moving forward uh, with these lessons in hand. So one of the first things I uh, identified was the fact that multi-domain operations, and this is what codified our doctrine, will must account for persistent contact across domains. But I think we really need to think about what that needs means. The persistent visual electromagnetic observation from air, space, and cyberspace will require our ground force to operate in dispersed groups to survive on the modern battlefield. And this is certainly something that we have a lot of practice to, to, to excel. The ubiquitous use of unmanned aerial systems, satellite imagery, sensor-based technologies, smartphones, and open source intelligence, which we'll talk to a little bit further, has equaled unparalleled transparency on the battlefield, which has created a great deal of challenges for deception. However, the Ukrainian armed forces have demonstrated with their, most recently with their offenses in last September, that deception is still possible. Uh, but it takes a, a syner synergetic mo uh, plan at the strategic, operational, and tactical level to achieve success, informed by an, an excellent I.O. campaign. And I think that this is, our research has indicated that this is a, deception is atrophied in our planning and simply over the last two decades, not something that we adequately consider when we uh, conduct our planning. 
currently. So I think the war in Ukraine has provided a great opportunity for us to reassess how we can reincorporate deception into our, our planning and execution of our operations. Next, uh, the idea of convergence in multi-domain operations may be necessary to conduct effective tactical combined arms operations, given the transparency earlier discuss, discussed. Given the lethality observed of large-scale combat operations in Ukraine, achieving convergence as we make conditions with C2 and sustainment, getting those multi-domain capabilities, those, these conditions that are necessary to facilitate execution at the tactical level may be something that we need to add into our planning. And the Army must broaden our conception of what combined arms means to leverage the multi-domain capabilities. It's no longer just air, fires, and infantry, and tanks. We need to create those windows of opportunity to be able to mass combat power as that's still effective at the tactical level, as Jay highlighted from our, our research. As the concept of MDO matures and our technology advances, we're going to need to re leverage these multi-domain capabilities to create these windows of opportunities. But I think we're going to need to look at how we integrate these or new organizational structures, and we're going to need to take a look at roles and responsibility at Echelon. Are we going to require a brigade commander, per se, to worry about multi-domain multi -domain effects, or is a headquarters above them going to create those conditions, and the brigade commander can fo focus on combined arms, which I can tell you is, is enough for that commander to chew on with this young staff. So that said, how do we create that uh, opportunity? And the Army must consider innovative options to execute multi-echelon training. We got to take a look at how we can expand beyond joint training exercise, war fighting training exercise, uh, combat training center rotations. A lot of these are considered in isolation and not necessarily holistically. You know, for example, war fighter exercises <laughs> often in two or three times speed. So how do we learn to synchronize convergence where you can operate something near simultaneously in space and cyberspace with the speed and tempo of uh, operations at the National Training Center where a single vehicle stuck in you know a wadi might slow an entire brigade's maneuver desynchronizing all the effects. I think we need to look at multi-echelon opportunities to synchronize the tempo and the timing of both convergence and combined arms to be able to achieve that necessary effect. I think in our research it's been clear that the greatest mul uh, vulnerability maybe even the Achilles heel to multi-domain multi-domain operations is our command post and sustainment nodes. As discussed earlier, our command post and sustainment nodes are, must significantly reduce their physical size, electromagnetic signature, and their capacity to rapidly displace. And we need to understand that the re area does no longer provides the sanctuary that once did. Uh, as a few examples, uh, four combined arms army from Russia which is roughly the size of a division headquarters, but is still smaller than our headquarters and more mobile, have been destroyed uh, during operations in Ukraine. Two of these headquarters have been destroyed multiple times with significant loss to senior leaders and experienced staffs with this you know, corresponding degradation and capability over time. You know, as referenced earlier, a Ukrainian battalion staff will have seven personnel. They will move twice daily, whether they need to or not, not like us where it's almost event-based by the enemy and then they will dig in every single time. I, that is gonna require a cultural shift in the way we look at our command post. When we look at our sustainment nodes, our lessons from Ukraine indicate that we're gonna to need to disperse our sustainment capabilities. You just gotta look at a brigade sustainment area, which is the size of a small city, and know that given threat capabilities and persistent observation, this can, can no longer work. And the Russians have had to extend their sustainment locks from 50 to 100 kilometers just to get outside a range of HIMARS. And we saw just in September there were 400 HIMARS attacks that targeted Russian C2 sustainment, logistical infrastructure and sustainment nodes, transportation nodes, effectively isolating Russian forces in the Kharazhan uh, region to set the conditions for that operational counterattack. But we're gonna need to look at how do we disperse these capabilities in depth and the, the, with existing technologies and how do we leverage future technologies to do that. So to get after some of this, uh, you know, some of the recommendations we came up with is the Army, and much of this is already in the works, but I, I think we could certainly speed up our efforts, is how do we invest significantly in low-cost drone countermeasures, tactical air defense, deception measures to create false command posts and statement nodes? Most importantly, I think we need a cultural shift. We need to learn to respect the effects of precision and massed artillery again to allow us to train the way we 
to, to change the way we train? How do we use the lessons to change our TTPs and our doctrine to effectively learn to do collaborative planning, distributed and current operations in a distributed manner to allow us to be more survivable in the current battlefield? And the last point I'll make on that is the Army must, we just simply, we're not considering heavily enough the, the effects of attrition on LISCO. How do are we gonna maintain the, the ability, the resiliency of multi-domain operations with attrition, the degradation of capabilities over time as we've seen with the Russians, how they've struggled to do more complex operations as, they've, as, they've, as they have lost a lot of their more experienced leaders and uh, staffs. And with that, I'll transition to the next slide, please. All right, briefing on behalf of my, my uh, great teammate. Uh, talking now about Intel, tech, and AI. So it goes without saying that the post-2014 Ukrainian defense intelligence and anti-corruption efforts and their ability to adopt NATO standards set the conditions for uh, Ukraine to be able to accept and utilize uh, Western intelligence, which has proved uh, instrumental to their success in many ways, as we've seen throughout. One of the things that they've done and some of the lessons observed was their ability to weaponize intelligence and the rapid declassification and intelligence and the use of classified, corroborated with open source intelligence. And this practice has been seen as a game changer. U.S. and Ukraine at the strategic operational tactical levels have been able to share intelligence and then effectively use I.O. campaigns to pre-bunk false flag efforts by the Russians as we saw just prior to the conflict beginning. The Ukrainians have maintained a public website in their defense intelligence agency to crowdsource intelligence over across social media to identify <laughs> Russian movements and alert them to prep, and using the population to alert them of movements. And you can just look on, on YouTube right now and see a number of that open source and get some pretty good intel estimates as you look at that. Research suggests an OSINT derived from publicly commercially available information of social media accounts for nearly 80% of the intelligence in the Russian-Ukraine war. OSINT, corroborated by classified means, enables a sharing, an ability to share both public uh, information and information with partners and allies instead of waiting for our, our laborious FDOs to declassify information. And OSINT has the possibility to help speed up the timeline considerably of our ability to share information. Current intel community systems make it very hard uh, to access OSINT and the corroborated information with our classified systems and sometimes uh, the ability for bad actor, actors to corrupt the information does uh, make it sometimes difficult for our IC community to uh, trust the information. PME should do more to, with advanced deception in the future of open source information to flood the information environment uh, to inform so we can look at deep fakes and other ways to conduct a deception in, in a more advanced way than we've done in the past. Next, moving to transnational corporations now operate independent of actors on the battlefield and can unilaterally deceive and or provide decisive intelligence and technological support to our partners and allies, which is new. Corporations such as Starlink, Palantir, and Maxar Technology provide critical support to Ukraine and sometimes have outpaced the support provided by the U.S. government. Uh, the current acquisition process, as we all know, is uh, somewhat cumbersome, and uh, some of these ways provide uh, means to get key capabilities to the warfighter much faster than. Some of the bad with this is corporations, they can e easily flood the zone and overwhelm our, our partners and allies with technologies that perhaps are not really or capable yet of employing, but we've seen the Ukrainians be quite, quite effective at this. The really bad is that being for profit, some of these corporations can provide some of the advanced technologies and parts found. An example of this is the Iranian drones that have been found with parts from Western nations from I think up to 12 different nations and US based and Western based companies putting a premium on technical intelligence in the future as a play a role in identifying the commercial origins of captured enemy equipment. This only enhances the private and public partnership will be key uh, moving forward. So moving to AI platforms, exponentially increase the effectiveness and in intelligence processing, exploitation, and dissemination. Dynamic targeting and fire, some of which uh, was covered by Jay uh, more adequately than I. The Titan program or platform receives air, land, cyberspace, and maritime intel sensor feeds 
and its integration of this platform must be ex expedited uh, as we prepare for LISCO. One of the current issues here is as the Air Force is developing a parallel system called CAFM, and the Navy is also developing a service-specific solution, how are we going to integrate these capabilities moving forward? And this is certainly going to be a challenge for JATC2 as we look at multi-domain operations. As a result, we should consider making intelligent sensors and systems a separate distinct uh, CFT uh, with Army Futures Command as a way to place emphasis on how we would integrate these capabilities moving forward. As Jay has already kind of highlighted, the ATO cycle, not only from the fire standpoint, but from an intelligence standpoint, also is becoming dated. And it is largely tied to large community of analysts enabled dynamic targeting. Uh, however, I AI is a way for us to better synchronize this, uh, these targeting cycles and also PME needs to take a hard look at how we can train data literacy and what are the ethics resulting around the use of AI platforms as we will probably be further constrained than our adversaries will with the use of AI. Uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Dennis. Hey. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You can go next slide, please. I'm um, Dennis Sarmiento. I'll cover uh, protection, sustainment, and medical findings that we've had. Uh, representing the efforts of Matt Holbrook, our engineer, we'll look at protection first. So uh, several assertions, and I think a lot of this you've seen in open source, uh, both, both assessments and criticisms. So we must begin to think of UAS as the IEDs of the next, of the next battle. Uh, proliferation of technology and e-commerce has made UAS available to both state and non-state actors. The lead time to develop and train is not very long. We've seen both Ukraine and Russian use of various unmanned systems uh, have a devastating effect and an effect over, over a wide range of operations, whether for ISR, uh, whether for uh, steerable munitions, UAS has undoubtedly shaped the battlefield. Uh, Steve covered in the MDO slide a lot of what we discussed in terms of PME, the findings from a protection standpoint. But I think in the end, we just don't know what we look like from above. And so we haven't uh, really, uh, I think, devoted a lot of uh, PME into leader and soldier training of what we look like, not just from above, but how to conceal ourselves um, within uh, a wide spectrum. Uh, of no, no American soldier has been killed by air actions since the Korean War. So staying hidden from above is not something that we are accustomed to doing, nor are our CTCs are, are necessarily challenging us uh, day in, day out. Uh, as, as mentioned before, we must be brilliant at the basics. Uh, we must practice basic soldier skills. And it's not just individual, but also collective in terms of equipment camouflage, dispersion, uh, movement. And we already talked about movement of, of uh, C2 nodes you know, jumping a talk twice a day, and perhaps most importantly, overhead cover. Foxholes and trenches may not be sufficient, especially with the, in the context of steerable munitions, long range precision fires, and especially mass. Um, we must continue to develop counter drone technology. Uh, and there, there are a number out there that are, that are commercially available. The drone defender is one that's been, that's been noted. Um, we must improve cyber warfare capability as well as develop uh, deception techniques, which again has, I think, comprises a, a very short paragraph if you look at the, the joint warfighting concept that we've had the opportunity to look at in the past in the past couple months. And so, yes, there's acknowledgement that that these are gaps, but I think deliberate actions um, you know, from a from a dot mil PF are indicated. Um, Steve already mentioned, you know, from an MDO standpoint, we have to look at the size of our critical enablers. Uh, and low density specialties. So for engineers, for example, within the first 38 days of the war, uh, Ukrainian Department of Roadways reported t over 23,000 kilometers of roadways, 273 <coughs> bridges destroyed, which would greatly tax our own uh, engineer capabilities, our own organic engineer capabilities. Uh, we acknowledge that cyber warfare will continue to grow in, in importance. Again, this is a lot of this is an open source. Um, and then we've also looked at uh, you know, some of our own gaps uh, that we've created of ourselves. So we've downsized uh, the size and, and really the, the capabilities, I think, of many of our ADA formations, which I think, especially now in Eastern Europe, we've acknowledged that this is a, a vital capability gap that not just we acknowledge, but also our, our allies and partners do. Uh, we should look for ways to decrease our, our electromagnetic footprint. 
Uh, thus far in the war, the Russians have not really had a whole lot of success in EM warfare, at least according to open source, but we must assume that they'll learn and we must assume that the Chinese will learn faster. Lastly, our leaders and soldiers must be prepared to operate in a dispersed and likely analog environment with persistent austerity and still be expected to prevail. Um, I'll go on to the next slide, please. We'll cover sustainment and medical. And so representing our logisticians work, uh, Derek Wesson, um, you know, we've already heard up front that mass matters. And, they, and even SAC here had mentioned that in, a, in discussion and describing the, you know, deterrence and defense uh, of plans that, that NATO has developed uh, just in the last year. Um, so as mass matters, uh, critical for effective fires and maneuvers, supporting this mass over time and space matters even more. Um, and matters even more so, especially with uh, any, any protraction of the conflict. So with respect to sustainment observations and findings, uh, you know, witnessing abject Russian failure and relative Ukrainian success, magazine depth, again, highlighted previously, and protection of interior lines can confer a significant advantage. Uh, these advantages only manifest with deliberate planning and programming. I think this is the failure that we've seen in multi multiple open source assessments and criticisms. Uh, the consumption rate of munitions and the state of the national stockpiles and industrial base have revealed kind of no, no epiphanies. In, in, in essence, it's they've, they've validated that, that these are gaps that our sustainment community has to look at uh, hard and fast. Uh, we need to look at uh, logistic capabilities during operational planning. Uh, for example, the United States <coughs> cannot make the same mistakes as it did in the Gulf War when it failed to keep up with the units uh, well enough supplied to account for potentially catastrophic success, right? So in, in some senses, we outpaced our, our lines of communication. Um, so on the flip side, nor can the U.S. repeat Russia's failures to maintain adequate supply chain as they grossly underestimated the time it would take to capture Ukraine. In fact, you know, uh, I think many are aware they probably carried no more than a three-day supply, operational supply, as they LD'd across the border, assuming they would be done within a week or two weeks. Um, and here we are, uh, you know, almost 15 months past. Uh, logistics planning, whether in preparing for war or attrition, or planning for uh, support <coughs> in support of uh, pulsed operations, needs to be sensitive to operations, or planning needs to be sensitive to operations in depth, that is, being able to accelerate supply chains from the industrial base to distribution to the brigade and below, prevent strategic failure, and, and again, exploit catastrophic success if it, if it manifests. Uh, again, not an epiphany, the United States must stockpile munitions with long lead times. Um, I think we're seeing this as we're trying to maintain the status quo in supporting uh, security assistance efforts in Ukraine. Uh, attrition stresses the industrial complex's ability to replenish stocks as the military depends on the industry to maintain this capability of producing the required supplies. Um, again, supporting the uh, Russo-Ukraine war via security assistance has challenged the status quo conditioned by the U.S. experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that's in particular for, for heavy munitions. Uh, and so I think we're seeing a reawakening of, of the organic industrial base. We've already discussed how we see ourselves and support ourselves. We must also reassess how to support our allies and partners um, and also reassess how we protect sustainment nodes. And they're already covered as far as uh, what's been discussed in MDO and especially facing the mass of fires that we anticipate. Um, again, bottom line, open source doesn't reveal much with respect to how much the Ukraine is protecting their interior lines, but it's clear that the doctrinal core support areas uh, DSAs, VSAs, field trains present a bright, large, and slow uh, target on the MDO battlefield. So again, organizing for LISCO and then training to support those adjusted formations um, will, be, will be a requirement in persistent austerity. And I'll finalize uh, the discussion here with medical. So one thing that we've acknowledged, I think, from U.S. experience is that uh, military medicine enables military effectiveness. And in this sense, uh, military medicine has enabled Ukraine military effectiveness, and this didn't occur overnight. And so a number of efforts occurred 
at the, at the state level. And so Ukrainian uh, national reforms enabled transformation of their military medical system. This occurred within the time span between 2010 and 2020. Um, and then this transformation has enabled battlefield adaptation, especially with the development of training uh, that extends provider reach. So the, the creation of better medics and the establishment of paramedics. Prior to 2016, this didn't exist under Soviet structure. Um, there was limited subspecialty care. There was limited, limited preventive medicine in that, in that setting. And there were absolutely no paramedics. Um, so I would say the, much of the Ukrainian experience has validated what we've done, what we've seen in our own joint medical community. And so this is consistent. What, what we have developed with the IRP group has been consistent with early med COE, uh, med seeded, NATO mil med, and other independent studies. But two primary themes uh, emerge. And this, this, these emerged consistently in the absence of air superiority, uh, in the conspicuous absence of the golden hour. And so there are things that we have to do to organize and train. So first, organizing for LISCO requires greater medical capability and capacity forward. That seems contrary to what we just described in terms of you know, C2 or, or sustainment node vulnerability. But we're just talking about just enough to confer survival benefit. And so we're talking about damage control, some minimal holding capability that is not just able, but also mobile um, to get you to the point uh, to your nearest roll one, minimal, minimally capable roll one. Uh, historical examples exist. In World War II, we had the portables, the portable surgical hospitals. Um, most recently, uh, US SOCOM employs golden hour offset teams, surgical teams. So again, smaller footprints, more agile, but Conferring that benefit at scale, I think, is a challenge that, that we may need to embrace. Um, of note, you know, the lessons learned from Russo-Ukraine in, in our own uh, interrogation of, of joint military medical capabilities, uh, division support hospitals are coming back. Uh, FDU designs are being, are being developed as we speak. Second, and this has probably been the game changer between Russian forces and, and Ukrainian troops, so tactical combat casualty care, so TC3, not just the training, but also just proliferation of the concepts at scale has improved survival for the Ukrainians. Uh, and this has been consistent with what we've seen in 20 years of GWAT. TC3, an extension of that prolonged field care and early use of whole blood has improved survival from Ukrainian casualties. This has been validated even in a report from the Ukrainian Surgeon General that was presented at a, at a international conference. Uh, so training and equipping in support of TC3 and, and prolonged field care uh, provides this pre-hospital benefit broadly. And what we've seen, especially in, ad in addressing hemorrhage control and hypothermia, uh, this has been the difference between uh, Russian deaths and Ukrainian survivors. Um, anecdotally, untrained Russian troops are LDing, uh, getting tampons to control bleeding, which is not advised. Uh, on the flip side, Ukrainian troops are stopping bleeding effectively. They're trained in TC3 concepts. They're, they're actively uh, providing the survival benefit in interior lines to include even the use of 3D printed tourniquets. And so there, there's a lot available in open source that describes how the military medic has made a difference for the Ukrainians. I can speak more on, on a couple other lessons learned, but we can unpack that in the questions. Um, I'll turn it over to, okay. actually go Thanks. to the next slide. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Kate. So as everyone can see, this is a lot of information. It's heavy. So we have 16 20 page papers to produce these kind of overarching lessons learned. And one of the important things that we learned during our research was the success of General Depew and Tradoc in 1973 really was born from the proliferation and distribution of the lessons learned widely. So they weren't stovepiped, they weren't put in a classified environment, they weren't done by a tiger team. And then the report came out three years later when it went through you know, a series of bureaucratic signatures. They were proliferated, new doctrine was developed, and everyone owned it from the E1 level to the four-star general level. So what we're trying to do here is put this into a product that can be widely distributed across the Army. It's probably not perfect, but we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. We don't know what's on the horizon. And these lessons are critical right now. 
Uh, thanks, Katie. The, the tough parts of this project, after trying to recruit a bunch of Army War College students to do what I told them from the start was going to be extra work. That was the first hard part. The next hard part was picking which War College students to put up here on stage. Any, any members of the team could have done it. Uh, and uh, the other hard part was distilling the lessons down to 45 minutes of slides. Katie did that hard part. I am obviously super proud of this team. Uh, we, we've got uh, uh, a couple of uh, folks in the room who we're going to call on for questions, I hope. Pav did a terrific work on uh, uh, U.S.-Ukrainian security cooperation. Steve Tranowski has already been mentioned with the, uh, the IRR. I also want to highlight the work of Sean Wiswesser, an Air War College student whose work has already been published in the journal Small Wars and Insurgencies. His piece, uh, um, Potemkin on the Dnieper, uh, looks at the failures of Russian air power. And so I'm super proud that we reached across to another PME institution as well. Uh, this work is uh, moving forward, as, as Katie just said. Uh, the person who is putting all of those papers together into a book is sitting here in the room. Uh, Gabby Boys is my intern from Dickinson College, uh, and she is uh, falling off her learning curve, but I'm grateful to her for the work she's going to do. We're hoping to publish that with SSI. Uh, we've also just been invited to present this work at the NATO-Ukraine Partnership for Peace conference in Poland this summer as an example uh, to the rest of NATO on what a lessons learned process looks like. Uh, hoping to do more of this work next year, hopefully with the return of maneuver to the Ukrainian battlefield as the long-awaited spring offensive mm -hmm. kicks off. Uh, made no, no um, uh, pretenses at, at, at this being an objective study. All right, we have been glory to Ukraine all the way through. Uh, Dan Miller, grateful that uh, uh, faculty member Dan Miller from Dinas, I think, is going to join me in that work next year. Rebecca Jensen, uh, who wrote a paper that's not listed here, um, uh, wants to join that work as well from Canada. So really proud of what this work uh, has done so far, what we hope it's going to do uh, to shape the Army going forward. Slide, please. Uh, and, and so, as, as uh, um, Katie said at the start, we think the Army's at an inflection point. We think uh, 73 is uh, a, a good intellectual vantage point to, to think about an Army that is recovering from two decades of not completely successful counterinsurgency in Asia, that is now faced uh, with the opportunity to learn lessons from an ally and partner facing large-scale combat operations. Shame on us. If we as an institution don't learn everything we can from the courage, the blood of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters and build a better army going forward, Katie and I have a piece we hope to publish in parameters that we're uh, literally working on uh, right now this week um, to, to, to try to encourage some of that going forward. But we have PowerPoint and will travel. Uh, very grateful to, to Ian. Uh, for sponsoring this work a year ago. We hope for sponsoring the continuation of this work next year and for some feedback he gave us just yesterday as all the members of the team were able to present to him. I'm also grateful to my friend and classmate Bob Hamilton uh, for anything he'd like to say about the study and, and perhaps to give this uh, audience some uh, insights into some of the work that uh, he's doing uh, as part of a team at the Strategic Studies Institute here at Carlisle. Bob. Sure, thanks, John, and thanks for, uh, for, for the invitation. So I'll, I'll start by saying uh, this is the second time I've seen this study briefed, and I think it's the most important work to come out of the Army War College in probably a decade. I say that not just because my classmate leads it. Uh, I say it because, for me, there were some epiphanies here. What this study did that, that we're not doing as deliberately at SSI, and I'll cover our study very quickly in a minute, is this study turned the lens very explicitly on us. What we're doing at SSI is we're looking at the Russian, Russian and Ukrainian performance and allowing people to draw inferences and in some cases explicitly saying this is what this means for us. Uh, but this study turned the lens on the United States Army and said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start, uh, I would say, uh, I'll paraphrase Trotsky here um, by saying you may not be interested in grinding attritional industrial age war, but grinding attritional industrial age war is interested in you. Right? And we forget that at our peril. There are not technological silver bullets that are going to get us, uh, allow us to, to, to supersede or to overcome some of the problems this study has identified. So 
The SSI study, uh, along similar trajectories in the category of it's better to be lucky than good, they developed independently, both here at the Army War College, uh, but I see them as complementary. We're, what we're looking at at SSI, uh, specific, especially the Russians, but also the Ukrainians were appropriate. We're looking at things like strategy planning, command and control, integrated deterrence, morale and leadership, ethical and legal norms, the war crimes question, uh, large-scale combat operations, as this study did, protracted conflict. We also have a security cooperation effort similar to the chapter that uh, Colonel Pop Strauss just did for this study. Uh, and then relevant history of the conflict, so a very a short history uh, of the conflict up to February of last year when it reignited with the, the full-scale Russian invasion. Uh, so I think it's it, – Russia didn't expect to fight this way, uh, and, and we don't expect to fight this way. And again, that's why I started with Trotsky, because Russia is fighting a war it didn't expect to fight. So we – when we uh, we look at Russia, we – so we – have fixated on this whole hybrid warfare idea. We've misunderstood hybrid warfare and the Russian idea of hybrid warfare since Gerasimov published his article in 2013. That was not a declaration of hybrid warfare against the West. It was an assertion that the West had been waging hy hybrid warfare against Russia for years and that Russia needed to be prepared to respond. The doctrinal Russian, uh, I guess, advance before this war, is what they called non-contact war, right? The, uh, this idea that this war they're fighting now was not the war of the future. The war of the future was going to be defined by persistent ISR, long-range precision strike, uh, which could be, in the, under the right circumstances, decisive. I think what the Russians have learned and what we should learn from this war um, is that not that those things were decisive, persistent ISR and long-range strike, but that they made decisive victory almost unattainable by making offensive maneuvers so costly uh, that you, you we haven't seen the lines in this war. We haven't seen the front lines change appreciably since the big Ukrainian advances in the north and the smaller advance in the south last fall. And the advance in the north was partially deception, partially just very, very bad, uh, badly prepared Russian units and, and badly executed Russian defense. So it was a, it was almost a, a, a an opportunity was given to the Ukrainians uh, by just poor Russian decision making, preparation and leadership. Um, Russia's attempt, so I look at three stages of Russian strategy in this war. The first stage, I, I think you can call Crimea on a national scale. It was, it was predicated on a lot of really, really uh, inaccurate and optimistic assumptions. The assumption that what happened, what they were able to do in Crimea in 2014, they would be able to replicate on a national scale uh, in 2022. It completely missed the fact that the Ukrainian, uh, 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 that armed forces of Ukraine um, had, were much more capable, much more committed, uh, and that this was an existential war for Ukraine in a way that 2014 in, in Crimea was not. Um, so that was stage one. Stage two was uh, this sort of grinding attritional industrial age warfare that they've been uh, trying to, to, to make decisive in eastern Ukraine. And the stage, they're, they're still, they're, they're sort of trying to do two things at once now. They're trying to pummel Ukraine from the sky, destroy the critical infrastructure, while they try to make incremental uh, gains on the ground that I guess the point is to take control of as much of the four uh, provinces, plus Crimea, the four provinces in Ukraine that Russia has, has formally annexed, uh, it, to take control of enough of those that Putin can frame it as some sort of victory. Uh, I don't see I don't see any way that that happens. Uh, and if they do, I don't see how they can hold it. So um, I don't think we're prepared to fight the war that Russia's fighting either. And this is why this study was, you know, there were so many epiphanies for me in this study. The, uh, the, the big things I took out of this study were the, the stadium jock uh, comment and the fact that I don't think we're prepared right now to do what the Ukrainians are doing and have battalion task forces with seven person headquarters that jump twice a day and don't have perfect situational awareness. I just don't see us able to fight that way. We may, if, if in an existential war, be able to learn uh, on the fly fairly quickly and do it. Uh, the reserve capacity that Steve Chernovsky in his chapter, uh, the, the numbers are staggering. And they weren't, I don't think they were briefed here like they were briefed the first time, but shocking. And, and we should be paying attention to this. Um, the fact that our industrial base can't keep up. And our allies and partners are worse off in that. I, I happened to, I interviewed the Ukrainian defense attache uh, to the US yesterday. And uh, one of the things he said was uh, our, our 
our 155 rate, let me get the numbers exactly right. Um, he said our 155 consumption rate, now he said he and General Milley had agreed on, or their, their Chief of Defense and General Milley had agreed on a Gimler's daily consumption rate, but their overall 155 monthly consumption rate uh, it's about 120K a month. Their partners uh, can provide about 30K a month. The EU, we can provide uh, a, a similar amount. So uh, we're not able to meet Ukraine's needs right now for just for plain 155 ammunition. So, uh, and we're rapidly approaching in a lot of places uh, the, the floor of what the Presidential Drawdown Authority will allow us to give them. Um, Mission Command. Again, it was decentralized operations, was hammered home here. I think we're better than most, but I don't think we're as good as we think we are or as good as we need to be. We're too power up, we're too centralized, we don't empower, we don't operate on intent as much as we think we do or should, we don't give junior leaders, I don't think, the authority that they need to have to be able to fight the way that Ukraine is fighting in order to survive. Um, and then finally, I would, uh, John, you mentioned it, but I would recommend, not briefed here, but uh, Colonel Pav Strauss's chapter on security assistance, security cooperation, uh, should also be required reading. Uh, my takeaway from that is our efforts with Ukraine were fairly ineffective in building, in transforming the Ukrainian military and allowing it to fight the way it is currently fighting until very shortly before the war. So an effort that really started in 1991, that kicked into a higher gear in 2014, um, but was fairly ineffective uh, for a lot of reasons that, that Pav outlines in the chapter until some, some changes very close to the start of the war, the, the, the start of presidential drawdown and all these other things, which come with, its own, they come with their own problems, right? The, again, the General Kremenitsky, the, the defense attaché, told me yesterday they have 20 plus, 20 plus types of armored vehicles uh, that they now have to, to, to logistically sustain. And let me get the... Uh, the different numbers of howitzers. I think it's eight different types of self-propelled artillery, up to 20 types of armored vehicles uh, that Ukraine now has to figure out how to sustain, how to repair, how to have parts for. Uh, in some cases, different types of fuel, different fuel filters, all these things that uh, the PDA, the presidential drawdown, was critical in allowing Ukraine to survive and to continue to fight, but there are downstream effects to that that they and we are gonna be dealing with for years. Um, so the 1973 comparison, I think, is apt. Uh, I just don't see the recognition at the national level that we're at that strategic inflection point, right? So 73 was the failure in Vietnam and then the Yom Kippur War. We have a strategic failure in Afghanistan that frankly I don't think we're acknowledging. I don't, I don't see the Department of Defense study on the failure in Afghanistan. I see some articles and parameters, but I don't see the, the demand signal from the national leadership to examine the failure in Afghanistan and understand what it means. So we have that combined with a major uh, land war in Europe between, as you said, uh, John, a, a great power, maybe a declining great power, and a middle power. Uh, so this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to fund, to, to look at things we've done right and wrong in the last 20 years, things the Russians and Ukrainians are doing right and wrong, learn from that, uh, and transform ourselves to, to, to better meet the challenges of the future. Uh, even if the Army, and maybe we will, but even if the Army sees this as an inflection point, there will be resistance from the other services, right? This idea is threatening to them. The ideas we're talking about here are threatening to the Navy and the Air Force and to some extent the Marine Corps uh, because what we're doing is saying this large-scale ground combat operations are not a thing of the past. There is no technological silver bullet. This is about uh, industrial capacity, manpower, personnel capacity, and all these things uh, that, uh, that the Army thinks are, is Im are important, uh, but those views aren't shared necessarily across the DOD. So um, I'll stop here. Uh, and again, I do think this is the most important work I've seen come out of the War College in a really long time. I hope people uh, outside of this room, outside of this installation uh, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere are going to read it and, and take it to heart. Bob, thanks for that. We've got uh, about a half an hour left. Uh, as folks uh, stand up to ask questions, I'm going to say that Bob, uh, we've got we've got one up. But Bob, you're going to um, you're going to be called on to answer questions. You may as well move up. Uh, get ready to take the chair. Uh, get ready to take the mic right here. Steve, you're going to get called. So be ready to come up and answer from the podium, please, sir. <clears throat> again, uh, good morning. So Colonel Play again from Army Europe, and I get to live this problem every day. Uh, so I appreciate the work, and I look forward to getting a chance to get my hands on the uh, publication uh, to share with my team. 
So one thing, you know, start prompt. Want to say that you know our observation right now, based on everything going on, is that you know by the time the conflict ends, Ukraine will have the most experienced combat force in Europe at this time. <clears throat> you know, and as I mentioned the other day, Poland with this modernization FMS will be the most modernized European army uh, going forward. And so the you know the start of the conversation with Katie, uh, with the Yom Kippur War and the lessons learned there. You know, the question I have and the question that my team debates all the time though is all the lessons that you have identified which are positive, <clears throat> but again, going back to the 1973 crisis in the beginning of the war here, everybody kept saying the tank was dead, for example. <clears throat> As we're about to watch the counteroffensive, the tank is alive again. So based on all the lessons learned, what are the wrong lessons though that were taken away from the conflict in Ukraine that we have to be careful that we don't uh, apply too much going forward? I'll start with where Bob ended, which is the idea that this couldn't happen again, this couldn't happen to us. And, and on the international relations level, which we haven't really talked about here, this has been a huge wake-up call to Europe. Right? NATO has expanded, the European countries have, have increased their defense expenditures. That has also happened in Asia. This has been a wake-up call, I think, to all of the free countries of the world to varying degrees that uh, great power conflict has not gone away, that nuclear weapons do not guarantee uh, uh, peace or security uh, at the great power level, and that they all need to pay attention to conventional war. Uh, the other big question for me, as I, I mentioned, I think, from that microphone on Tuesday, is the question of uh, whether the decision to pivot to Asia, that China is our pacing threat, uh, not, notwithstanding everything, uh, everything scary Ian said, and the even scarier things Ian would said if you let him pin him down in a skiff, <laughs> right? There is no doubt that China is developing capability, but uh, Russia is using capability, and Russia has demonstrated an ability to use it. And that's perhaps the other lesson that I think isn't going to be learned. I'm going to turn it to the rest of the uh, the audience. Or, or, or I, I think China is paying a lot of attention to what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm confident that China has noticed that Russia can't cross a contiguous land border and take over a much smaller country next door. And, and an infinitely more difficult task, a uh, hundred mile uh, water gap crossing, uh, I think is still well, well, well beyond the wildest dreams of China, China the, of the PLA. That doesn't mean there aren't other ways for them to, to uh, accomplish some of their objectives, but uh, my overall lesson is, is, as I said yesterday, China can wait. Uh, we've got friends in a knife fight, and we need to give them everything they've got, every, everything we've got. Uh, rest of the panel, anybody else? Steve, go ahead. Well, I, I think one of the lessons we need to learn is that, you know, you could look at the Russian performance and assume that they're, they're just bad. Uh, but you are seeing them adapt slowly. Uh, and with their culture adaptation is hard but if you look at you know a lot of my study talked about you know force design and that the russians built the wrong military for the strategic objectives that putin asked them to perform you know they, their doctrine of active defense their btg construct that worked well in the donbass wasn't well suited for large-scale combat operations they they gutted their conscription uh you know, their contract soldiers, which, you know, they had a lot of limitations in their force design. So I think we need to take a hard look at, are we building the, the right force for the future? You know, I, they take away my, my spurs as an armor guy, starting to question the necessity for division reconnaissance, armored division reconnaissance, when you look at the way the Ukrainians conducted reconnaissance for the counteroffensives using small mobile teams and UAVs. Are we gonna be effective conducting reconnaissance with armored formations? Is that the way of the future? So I think we need to take a hard look at, are we creating the right formations for the next conflict? Or are we you know, going to learn some of the hard lessons that the Russians learned by building the wrong force the, for the wrong fight? So that, that'd be my question. I would just add one thing. I wouldn't say it's a wrong lesson. I would say it's a gap in lessons. And it, that's the study of irregular warfare from this campaign. Um, it's you know often stovepiped and put a little, put with special operations forces rather than within the conventional force as well and just people understanding irregular warfare. I mean, Russia and China are not going to poke us 
where we want to be poked. They are going to do anything that they can to remain below the threshold of armed conflict. They do not want a retaliation for us. They do this through their conduct of irregular warfare. So while we are focused on the traditional warfighting functions in the army, you know, I think that there is a gap right now in studying how the Ukrainians have executed their regular warfare campaign and how we can counter the, something like that in the future. Bob, you know? Just, uh, I would say, um, don't count the Russians out yet, right? The Russian army is no smaller now. It took 100,000 casualties in the last five months. It's about the same size now as it was when the war started. So they have the ability to generate and regenerate manpower. Um, the political stability of the, of the Putin regime, I, I won't get into, but um, and they've taken incredible material losses, right? Um, but the, their theory of victory is predicated on exhausting us, not not necessarily exhausting Ukrainians. But if, if the Western aid dries up, then Ukraine's in a really bad position. Uh, so Putin's theory of victory is is I'm going to drag this out, uh, and and I'm going to exhaust. Ukraine's partners. I'll hope for some electoral results and key partners that may make them less willing to help Ukraine, uh, and we'll see where this goes. Right. So there, the, I don't. I don't see any. I don't see any possibility for the Russians to turn around tomorrow and sue for peace and, and you know agree to some reasonable political settlement for this. They're in this for the long haul, and as long as Putin's in power, one of my uh, ambassador John Teft, who's the former. He was an uh, ambassador in Georgia when I was there the first time, and he was also the ambassador of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. And, and he says all the time, this war won't end with Putin still in power. It's personal for him. It's legacy. It's existential for him. So as long as he is in the Kremlin, this war doesn't end. So, I, I, oh, you, go started ahead, you started out with um, the question of what was the impact of the senior leadership attrition rates within the Russian military. And I think you, you just highlighted, you know, the, the Russians don't count them out. And I'm just wondering if you're going to answer that question for us. What really is the impact then, if we don't count the Russians out, of you know their senior leadership being kind of systematically decapitated, if you will, uh, over the last you know more than a year of this war now that they're in? I mean, can, can they sustain that and continue to have that momentum that you're talking about? Don't, don't count them out. So I don't think, uh, sir, I don't think they need to sustain momentum. They just need to stay in the war. Uh, they need to stay in the war until we lose our resolve, uh, until if Ukraine is exhausted. And, you know, Russia's about three and a half times the size of Ukraine in terms of, you know, uh, total population. Uh, they have learned not to do these mass partial, these partial mobilizations. Uh, that now they're doing e-mobilization, right? So they, they're not, they didn't announce that, 300,000 person mobilization like they did uh, last late summer, early fall, because that that engendered a little bit of protest in certain parts of Russia. And so now now they've they've taken it. It's just sort of it's constant and it's it's electronic. People are notified electronically. So there's uh, but I, they can continue to generate personnel strength, I think, for a long time doing it that way. If they're not going to be well trained. They're not going to be well led. They're not going to be well equipped. But all they have to do is stay on the battlefield, stay in the fight. If, So, so, sir, we looked at that uh, pretty carefully since that was the specific General Funk uh, question General Funk asked us to look at, and we were, were smart enough to figure out that he had four. So we, we tried to answer that. What we learned was that uh, first, as, as Steve Chadwick noted, the, the Russians have gotten better, and, and so what looked like unbearably high rates of general officer attrition early in the fight have tapered off. Uh, and if you look at the, the course of the war, too, we, we ended uh, with, with calendar year 22. Uh, over, over the course of the, the fight in calendar 22, Russian general officer casualties were not dissimilar to those of the United States Army during World War II. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, what, what looked like the biggest problem when I, I, I literally think it was a conversation with, with Ian and General Funk um, back, back, in, uh, back last summer before we got started, uh, it has turned out to be um, historically sustainable, and, and um, right, the, the, uh, on both sides, right? The, the, um, I, I think both sides are getting better, um, 
I think the, the, the big question for us, and our focus was on us, um, I, th I think Bob's question is looking more at, at the actual conduct of the war. We're looking at changing the U.S. military. Um, there are things we need to learn in PME, but the specific question General Funk was asking, do we need, need to be able to prepare battalion commanders to become division commanders at the drop of a hat? Um, there there are, are, are plenty of, of uh, fully trained Army War College 06s who can, who can handle those responsibilities if we need them. Over. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go to this question over here, please. Hi, Joe Crescido, Space and Missile Defense Command. You were talking about uh, operating in a degraded environment, how we need to go back to compass and map. And I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a little background on how the Ukrainians, did they experience a degradation in their environment to operate? Uh, and how did they overcome it? I know that Starlink came in. That was one thing. But are they operating degraded right now? Or is have they mitigated that? Was it very temporary? What's the landscape look like now? So I'm, again, I'm, I'm hearing uh, social media. I'm hearing open source. Well, that doesn't sound like we're disconnected. So I was kind of wondering, how did we get where we are? So in the research, obviously, uh, Ukraine's using uh, open source heavily. Uh, heavily, they're, they're using their Android smartphones armed with this uh, application that's either just Arda or Crop Yava which is providing that convergence of C2 uh, intelligence, and they're able to target on that very quickly. So while they aren't operating in a degraded environment as we'd see it, it's, I think, more of a, a concern. Are we willing to assume the risk to allow uh, to use civilian network infrastructure to uh, fire, to plant targets, to gain intelligence off of? Are we willing to accept that risk um, in our operational and targeting process? Uh, but we have to be prepared that it'll be more uh, of a denied environment for us where we will have to be comfortable with the basics of having a map and a compass and just remembering that our commander before we crossed LD said this is the intent and this is the end state and we operate based on that and then we empower our junior, our subordinate leaders to adapt and achieve that end state versus them looking at a JCR screen wondering what do I do next so because the JCR screen might not populate so let me, let me add to that. Do you think that would, as one of the observations through this, uh, if we are operating in a degraded environment and you're saying operate degraded and prevail, does that assume that the adversary is also operating in a degraded environment that we have created? Or is it the adversary is operating relatively unmitigated and undegraded and we're at the disadvantage? What, how, where are we at on this? Is, is, it, is, is the playing field level when you're talking about operating degraded, or are you thinking that we'll be degraded and they'll be relatively solid in their connectivity? Because I'm thinking that that would be a huge imbalance equivalent to like 1991 when we came in in Desert Storm and were you know, pretty enabled, the adversary was not enabled. The research, I, again, open source was that it was, to some degree, it was both sides. And if you have a large degree at the beginning of the war, the Russians were hindering their own ability to communicate as much as the, the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians had similar capabilities. So to kind of get after your question, I think both sides struggled to communicate. And then there was a lot of innovative ways to circumvent that. The Russians have improved in their ability to utilize EW. Uh, the Ukrainians have improved in their ability to target Russian EW to open up space for them to be able to communicate. You know, Starlink, an, an innovative solution that, you know, many of us probably wouldn't have foreseen, uh, to Clay's point about using those off-the-shelf technologies coming in. And then, you know, just yesterday I saw an article how they're using wire technology that, you know, we had when I first came in the Army that we used in the 60s to, just like we did in World War One to line trenches so they could communicate without uh, being targeted. So I think what they're doing is, one, both sides are learning you know, I'm talking most specifically about the EW piece, and then at the same time, there's innovative solutions across the board, from very rudimentary to highly technical, like Starlink, to circumvent the issue. So, but I think the challenge is how do we how do we have that effect against the enemy, but not degrade ourselves? And you know, and I think routinely, if we go to our combat training centers, we'll see that we we hurt ourselves as much as we hurt our, hurt the enemy, oftentimes, and we do this ourselves. So I think we have a lot to learn as well. Hopefully that gets after your question. Thanks, Duke. Craig? Thank you, John. I want to commend your panel for uh, the efforts they've done. It looks like you've got quite the platoon there helping work on this, and 20 chapters is going to be something that we're looking forward to looking at. 
Um, one thing that I, I it highlights what um, Ian talked about starting off this morning, but if we're talking about large-scale combat operations, and I understand that what they're doing in Ukraine is a little bit bigger than what we've seen in the past in doing coin and, it's, and that, but we're set up to do BCT kind of still operations. We're not moved to divisions. We're not comfortable working with divisions. We don't do NTCs with the divisions, and let alone not cores or understand completely what the theater army is supposed to be doing for us for setting the theater to enable operations. I don't know if you guys looked at it from that perspective. I know you had some comments about divisions and BCTs and that kind of thing, but um, what, do you, what would you recommend is, is number one on that if, if that's something that you did address? And number two, I know you have a Ukrainian officer sitting out there, and, and we'd love to hear from him because I'm sure he's got some insights or something that he can share with us if it doesn't put him too much on the spot. I know he's been part of your team and he's done a, quite a bit, but we'd be uh, very interested in hearing what kind of insights he might have. Thank you. First question, you take first question. Okay, so uh, kind of getting back to something I briefed earlier, I think one of the greatest uh, things that we could do is, you know, for good reasons and privileging certain training objectives, our warfighters operate in two to three times speed. One of the things, you know, just recently I was at the National Training Center, what I don't think that teaches, you know, young majors that are learn, trying to get the reps and sets of combined arms warfare at the division level is like how long things take. So I think how long a brigade takes to uncoil from an assembly area when you, you can hit a button and that happens nearly instantaneously in a warfighter, but in reality that's hours or even days. And what if somebody gets lost? You know, and then we're learning how to synchronize sustainment and intelligence and ISR and all of these things in warfighters. So a greater connectivity with CTC rotations with warfighters and even better joint exercises, you know, my fear is how are we going to synchronize something that we can do with a push of a button in cyberspace with a brigade moving? I can tell you my humble experience when I was at NTC last year and we tried to incorporate multi-domain operations into a rotation is the brigades could never make the window that we created for them that the opportunity existed. They just couldn't get there uh, because the window, you know, that the division is planning that isn't necessarily taking into account the science of how long things takes. What if it rains? You know, and we're going to take a little longer. So that's why, you know, I talked to you earlier. How do we leverage these exercises in a multi echelon way to get after? You know, the experience comes from seeing how long things take. And we're certainly just not getting the reps and sets to be able to do that. And then how do we do that with predictive sustainment? We're going to have to dislocate and disaggregate our sustainment, and we can't consolidate it when, like the Russians, their doctrine states we sustain at 50 kilometers, they're now doing it at 100 kilometers. How does that, we're already challenged with predictive sustainment. When we double the distance, how are we going to do that? So I think how are we going to be able to sustain operations in, in timing and tempo? Sure, there's a, there's a bunch of those challenges across every warfighting function when you start looking at the division staffs and how many of us have experience doing that kind of thing at division corps or theater army level. And that, that, that's a challenge we've got to work on, you're right. Thank you. I, I want to take the question from uh, remote, and I'm going to ask Bob to come up and take the first shot at it. So the question, I'll read it quickly. Uh, the reinforcing war stocks, defense industrial base, and the question is uh, security cooperation, both to outsource production capacity, capacity to our allies and partners, but then more broadly, how has security cooperation helped uh, Vlad and his friends, brothers and sisters uh, accomplish the extraordinary tasks that they've accomplished. And Pav has been working in that area and wrote, uh, as Bob Hamilton said, I think an absolutely terrific chapter. It didn't fall under the warfighting functions, that's why he wasn't up here. But I really wanted to give him just a couple of minutes to, to talk, both to answer that question and to talk through uh, your chapter as quickly as you can, Pav. I'll do as quickly as I can. So to the question itself, I think there, there are two different aspects to this. We did not look, or I did not look from a domestic perspective, that's not really what I do. But I think there's a political angle to that, and there's also a legal angle to that. You're asking a U.S. congressman to take American taxpayer dollars and put them into a foreign country. So Korea has a greater shipbuilding capacity than we do, but is any U.S. congressman that comes from a state that has shipbuilding capability going to be willing to take that money and offshore it? I don't know. That's a bit past my purview. I'm not mistaken, also been pointed out that we cannot legally create uh, plastic explosives, C4, in this country anymore because of our environmental laws. Are we really going to change those laws so we can do it again, or are we going to keep outsourcing that? So some of these questions are a bit past my ability to answer, but I would say that realistically speaking, we're probably going to have to outsource some of this 
And as you look around here at our NATO partners, we have some pretty high-end capability, rather limited capacity. And countries that we used to have very stalwart capability back in the Cold War probably don't have the capability anymore and might not have the capacity anytime soon. So with some of our Asian allies, and Korea in particular, a pretty good mix of capability and capacity again. Unfortunately for us, they're on the wrong side of the Pacific. So how are we going to go about, if they're going to be our outsourced uh, shipbuilding, our outsourced plastic explosives, how are we going to get that back here in time of crisis with China? That's a, a whole other question to look at. So to the, and I, I assume the question came from Colonel Tobias, who's a fellow foreign area officer, DIB being defense institution building. That kind of takes me back to, to my paper. So broadly speaking, what I looked at was the history of security cooperation with Ukraine from the U.S. from 1991 up to the present, which is a little bit different than what everybody else did. They were looking at war fighting functions in the current crisis. So roughly speaking, there were three findings on my part. One, when security cooperation works well on our side, there is very high level involvement. The two big successes we've had with Ukraine were back in the early 90s up to about 2002, the denuclearization, getting the Soviet nukes out of Ukraine, and then also recently with the arming of Ukraine. Now, both of those had U.S. presidential level involvement and multiple secretaries. For denuclearization, the Secretary of Defense at the time made six separate trips out there to finally get them out of there. Clearly, uh, the presidential drawdowns right now are happening at the presidential level. Sec State and Sec Def are all involved. The Chad from Ukraine has regular calls with our chairman. Pretty high level involvement, pretty good success. As was alluded to, for roughly 20 years in between the uh, denuclearization and the arming process, we essentially said, you got it. You're good, Ukraine. Good luck and go forward. Here's some money. We'll see what happens. And not much happened. Uh, now, for many reasons, we'll kind of come to this the next finding, but we were not pushing it. We let it go. And even back in 2004, when we had the Orange Revolution, our security assistance uh, mechanisms took so long that by the time the people who were there working in the country put in the package that, hey, Ukraine could use this thing to take advantage of the Orange Revolution, by the time they got it, it was almost 10 years past. You just can't, it's, it's not effective. So that was one issue we had. You need high level involvement. The other thing is the partner, if we're asking for transformational change and the partner is not interested, it's not gonna happen. If there is no internal desire and there is no transparency on the part of the partner, it's just not gonna happen. And Vladimir kind of alluded to that earlier. There were some issues on the Ukrainian side of things. Uh, but if you look at the end of the Cold War, many of our, uh, our NATO partners now who came out of the Soviet Union were very, very interested in change. They were very open. Here are our problems. Here's what we need to do. Here's the gaps. Please help us get it done. And when you have that kind of transparency and you have that kind of desire, nine times out of ten you can get it done. But if the partner doesn't want to do it, it's not going to happen. And then the, the last finding was looking at our point. I think we saw this in Afghanistan, too. We have a tremendous desire in the military to succeed at all things. And if you give me a stoplight chart, you give me a year or two, it's all going to be green. Is it really green? I don't know. Probably not. But we have this issue now. We try to build in conditionality to what we're doing. So for the uh, Ukrainian Security Assistance Initiative, that was our bill. The Congress's bill said, okay, we're going to give you two tranches of money over a two-year period. We'll implement tranche one, we'll come back, we'll see how it did, and then if that's good, we'll give you tranche two. The way the bill is written with its timeline, tranche one is implemented, but by the time I need to give you that report for tranche two, we've already passed the deadline. So tranche two is coming anyway. So Ukrainians can see that, so why bother changing? It's gonna come anyway. So moving forward, those are three things. So what do we wanna do as we're looking at how do we fix ourselves? It really depends on us being honest with ourselves and having partners who are interested in change. And that's what we're looking at. So pending questions? Uh, we, we still have uh, uh, questioners waiting. The, the panel's going to stick around. I'm really disappointed that we didn't get uh, Steve Tronowski up to talk about just how bad uh, the uh, IRR numbers are and what that means for our strategic depth as a nation. Uh, but uh, um, my, my hope is that uh, the Army War College is going to um, Strategic Studies Institute, but I think Bob's going to write an endorsement. Uh, the, the press is right there in his building, and we're going to get these lessons learned out as fast as we possibly can. No pressure, Gabby, but uh, please join me in thanking this terrific team of Army War College students. John, you've given us a lot to think about, and I know we've only hit the wave tops, if that, and we're still sort of flying over with our, our seagull wings and haven't touched the water yet, but um, I appreciate all the efforts that you're your team has put into it. You've raised a lot of questions, and we'd really like to talk to you some more about this. So we are going to take a break until half past the hour. We have one more panel for you, and then uh, we'll meet back here at half past. Thank you so much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you.